race to the finish line could be instead a race to the grave. That's basically the story of uh, Death Race 2000, the original in 1975, directed by Paul Bartel, produced by Roger Corman, and uh, the remake, of course, in uh, 2008. I'm John Chang with Dan Edmonds. Hi there. How are you doing? <laughs> so um, I think this time around, uh, we kind of talked with different times about some different apocalyptic uh, visions and stuff like that. And it seems like, um, you know, sometimes there's um, times when these are more popular. And uh, I think I have a feeling that uh, some of what you're going to be talking about is, is uh, you know, in this area and stuff like that. So I guess, you know, what are your thoughts on like kind of why sometimes we have a darker vision of the future and, uh, and, you know, what inspires films that uh, are related to that? Wow. Good guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, they do seem to come along. And I, and I think what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Death Race 2000 um, pretty much is to some degree the blueprint for plenty of other movies. Oh, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, we've got, you've got The Running Man, again, post-apocalyptic yeah. kind of downtrodden US where people complete, uh, compete in a, in a sort of violent game in order to win their freedom or whatever. Right. And, and I mean, you know, the, uh, the Hunger Games. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, apparently this is almost like a, a front run uh, movie on Rollerball in that mm. I think this came out before because he was anticipating Rollerball and tried to do his own kind of cheap and quick, dirty version of it, which actually is, you know, it, it's quite, it, it's, you can look at it that way, but there's also some other, you know, when you dig into it a little more, there's some really interesting stuff going on in Death Race 2000. But yeah, Rollerball is clearly the the closest um, comparison and, and a good movie as well. And I mean, I, I mean, I would say The Hunger Games is the most modern interpretation mm. of that. You yeah. know, a society that's kind of on the brink of collapse with massive inequality and people competing yeah. in a violent game. Um, it obviously takes itself much more seriously. But, mm. um, you know, it's not, the, not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. Why it becomes popular at various points of time is more interesting um, because I don't, in a way, I don't think, and I'll get onto it later on, but I don't think the sequel is about the same things that the original is about thematically. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, the original for me seems to be almost like a satire of the media and it's glorification of violence. Basically that's one of the major themes in it. Um, why it happened in the mid 70s i mean you had a lot of crime upticks at, at, at that point in time i think actually I, I think crime and fear of criminal activity actually has a much bigger impact on what we will go and see at the cinema than perhaps people would appreciate because i think when i look at yeah, and, and I'll, I'll get into that, I guess, with the remake, with the timing, because the Hunger Games is similar. But, um, yeah, so anyway, the, uh, in terms of, like, uh, well, how, what, what's good about the, uh, the satire of the media in Death Race 2000 is that you, ha you have these very kind of cartoonish uh, drivers, mm -hmm. and at first thoughts you just think, oh, these are very sort of random, stupid kind of ideas for drivers. But actually what they are is movie genres when you look mm. at each one, because you have Frankenstein. He represents like gratuitous violence through horror movies. Mm. You have Joe Viterbo, who's gangster right, movies. Right. You have the, the gladiator in the mm. lion, come on, what the, 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 the team's name is. And then you've kind of got the Calamity Jane in the right, bull Western. car Western. So, you know, right from the offset, you know, he's clearly sort of, making a satire of, of, of Hollywood. Um, so it's, and, and I mean, even that, you know, I would say Frankenstein's mask is a little bit like the robot from Metropolis. Mm. It looks kind of similar to that. So uh, yeah, it, it doesn't, this is not a movie that takes itself too seriously. And right. those, those characters are pretty, when you realize that's what they are, they're pretty obvious really and, and very over the top. Yeah, and, and um, by now, like, um, you know, Roger Corman had, you know, done quite a career. And, the, you know, like something we'll just mention a little bit ahead of time this, um, is that uh, we'll be talking about the Fast and Furious, which uh, turns out to be his only his second movie. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see like kind of the differences, right, between such an early work and then this one where he's kind of really much 
hit his stride. He's really hit his groove and stuff like that. Um, and Roger Corman kind of, uh, besides, you know, his kind of uh, being known for, you know, this kind of exploitation type movies, he's also just really, um, you know, all about like kind of bringing like kind of a lot of talent and uh, giving them a chance to stop it. I mean, you know, here you have, uh, you know, Dave Carradine um, and uh, Sylvester Stallone early on in their career and, mm. you know, giving them their first shots at, you know, kind of more starring role, um, you know, much sooner than, you know, they gotten with other, you know, kind of directors and stuff, you know, of course, coming up. Yeah, and let's not forget Martin Cove from Karate Kids in there as well. Mm. Oh, right, the, right, right. Uh, yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah, yeah, I had, that was, had no that idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think most of the female leads in this are they tend to be kind of like staples of some of roger corman's movies but perhaps yes. not the wider sort of like no. um, movie industry but um but but very you know very talented and they really put in interesting performances all the way through <laughs> it's uh it's um it's good stuff but um yeah i mean it's uh, it's an interesting idea this whole idea that you know you're you're trying to placate a, a society by having really really gratuitous you know deaths I think the interesting thing for me in this one that that isn't um, often in in these kind of post-apocalyptic movies is this idea of actually scoring points oh, uh, yes. <laughs> for, for, for the, the more sort of weak and uh, the, the the people in society are. It's like a you know a real kind of depopulated population kind of uh, yeah strategy you would say of that future society. It definitely like echoes, uh, you know, Corbin's uh, kind of somewhat dark, somewhat twisted sense of humor. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. some, things like, you know, euthanasia dead at the hospital. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But they just wheel them out. And I and I think that's, um, you know, just their just the old people's expression speaks to a kind of because um, they're just all there happily sitting there waiting to get mown down by Frankenstein and various people. And um you know, that sort of placidity is, is probably what he's looking at is saying, you know, this could happen if everyone just like gets too distracted by all this, you know, all the sideshow, so to speak. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of going back a little bit to, um, you know, the idea of the apocalypse and stuff like that, uh, around the mid 70s, there was also this, you know, pessimism about, you know, things running out like oil, like that, that was yeah. a huge thing. And so, this was really like um, the idea that in the future, you know, only like, you know, for these kind of extravagant kind of events and stuff like that, uh, would we kind of, you know, expend that much oil? Because, you know, like for driving across the country, that's a lot of gas, of course, and everything. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, because especially in the 70s, where most cars, there was no such thing as fuel efficiency or, you know, like that kind of idea either. Yeah. And I mean, we were at the big, I don't know if it was the beginning, but, you know, that was part of a big commodity super cycle. So the prices of all sorts of things were going up. And, you know, we had a lot of inflation all the way through right. uh, late 70s, early 80s. So, you know, again, we're looking at a sort of a macro issue that's been represented in the in the in the movie. And I mean, the Hunger Games has probably done that the most effectively in recent terms because of an inequality is it because in this one, you don't see you see like uh, obviously the president who's doing quite well, but he's portrayed as a dictator because he has his summer house right. in Europe or whatever. Um, and so he's not even in America when this is all going on and it's supposed to be the big event of the year. But it, it, unlike a kind of a ruling class of elites as you would get in the Hunger Games. So, yeah, and I mean, it's a very kind of, it's, it's kind of, um, again, it, it's kind of slightly anti-communist, I would say, in its general kind of theme because United, the, the, the Stars and Stripes is now just kind of like the stripes and they're red and there's just mm. a big sort of totalitarian fist instead of any stars. So <laughs> it's, um, and it's what the United Provinces of America rather than the United mm. States. I, I always think of provinces as something that you would use if you were describing areas of China. That's mm. so that kind of. Yeah. It, yeah. Did you notice that in the in the audience, uh, in the stands and stuff like that, you had like, you know, Nazi symbols and like, yeah, you know, yeah. just other, I thought that was interesting that like kind of, you know, um, I mean, I hate to say it, but almost like foreshadowing of like, you know, um, these past, you know, these, oh, these yeah. recent years, you know, like the Trump era and stuff. Totally. I mean, in a way it, it did the, the and it is actually quite prescient, this movie, in that there is this cartoonish surreality 
to the drivers and the people in the audience and their lack of kind of knowledge or bearing of what these different characters represent or what does the swastika even represent obviously people in the crowd don't care anymore by the year 2000 right. so this detachment from real kind of history and learning or what actually happened uh, and creating some you know uh, engineered reality will say seems to be the theme all in the name of entertainment i mean that's really what it yeah, comes yeah. down to for both yeah. you know the original and the remake yeah yeah absolutely i mean i also thought um yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, get distracted and this is what will happen, you know. Um, and, I mean, also, it, I think this was quite sort of predictive of reality TV mm. in the, you know, it's it's the real reality TV, really. And, and you know, the, the sequel kind of picks up on that more. But, again, you sort of predicted that. But by the same token, you know, reality TV is not that new. If you, mm. if, if you think about it, the 70s actually kind of saw the early prototype reality TV because you had Chuck Barris with things like The Gong Show, mm. uh, The Dating Game. You know, he was a real innovator. He basically mm. started reality TV, but right. in quiz show form. Right. So maybe, you know, Roger Corman was looking at this and thought, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's the future and kind of just made a more extreme version of it. And now that you mentioned it, um, I'm thinking of like this uh, competition they used to have called the Battle of the Network Stars. Um, and I, I'm not sure how popular it is, like kind of, you know, around the globe and stuff like that. Yeah, so it was around um, between 76 and 88 that they would like have these annual kind of things with like the, the networks would have their stars, you know, like kind of competing against the different, you know, so you have like, you know the stations basically competing through their stars so so not, not yeah. only the ratings right which is another form of competition or anything like that now you have a physical embodiment of that so like kind of you know i mean talk about like kind of you know uh prescient uh i mean mm -hmm. like it, the, you know here they here these stars are actually in competition i mean granted it wasn't as violent you know like no. the most the most violence was like you know falling into like um, a spinning barrel of, you know, like, 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 like a, a pool of, uh, with, with, you know, from the spinning barrel and stuff. That's oh, yeah. probably about as violent as it gets. Or, or like the, um, the throwing the softball, so the dunking the, uh, the star and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, we used to have sort of like, but they were, they were often reserved for like sort of Easter or Christmas, but you used to have mm -hmm. like a quiz show okay. called Blank, Blankety Blank in the UK, and you'd have Celebrity Blankety Blank, right, and you'd right. have, it, it's a knockout, which was again a kind of like a silly kind of, obstacle course thing and you'd have celebrity yeah. it's a knockout and all that kind of stuff so you know these things aren't really new and in a funny in a funny sort of way the reality tv where we were just watching people was probably the biggest departure from what had gone before now they're actually will return to that and they're all kind of like mm. this has to be a competitive element to make them interesting but um yeah no it was, it was he definitely called it it's funny how um with the reality tv like the, the ones that all kind of, I mean, you know, you have some of the ones that's like um, a little bit more the heartwarming kind of things with like, you know, like uh, undercover boss and everything, but a lot of them were around competitions though. So it's like almost like this kind of, I don't know, this thing that we have where like, you know, we can't have reality without competition or something, you know, like, yeah. like, like, you know, for me personally, um, you know, like Tango is actually one of those things that like, I, I, I never really understood how they have a competition about it because it's really supposed to be about dancing and like connecting with your partners like that. It's supposed to be about just, just the pure enjoyment and the art of it and everything. But then, you know, like here you have competition and which kind of emulates more of the dancing with the stars kind of thing and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's always interesting how you, I mean, it's how do you, how do you really judge dancing with the stars? It's you just know? like, you know, and I think that's what they realized with that show is that, you know, it's more important to who people like and who's going to carry on watching the show as to who's actually like doing a good job. And it's more like the story of how they went from being terrible to actually like a half decent dancer and all that kind of stuff. That's repeated, you know, ad nauseum year after year. But um, yeah, speaking of um, repeating things and bringing them back from the dead, I thought <laughs> Frankenstein was a really interesting name. Mm. For our right. protagonist, Frank Frankenstein is not normally the hero of any movies, no. so that's quite an interesting choice. But of course, you know, originally this is a, a monster that was created from the from dead bodies, right. um, and that eventually turns on its creator, which is exactly what happens. Again, spoiler alert! Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, 
you know, difference, the difference being in that one of the things about the original Frankenstein that's interesting is that he is supposed to be, it's supposed to be kind of like an anti-science, um, I would say, story in that, you know, by man being in his hubris, creating something that it's, it's terrible for society and society will mm-hmm. turn on it and destroy your creation. In this mm-hmm. one, you actually have the opposite in that you have society mm-hmm. loving the creation and actually supporting mm-hmm. its overthrow of, of society in a way. Right. So, but that was, you know, but it was an interesting one. I just thought what the other thing I thought was really funny is that, you know, he's introduced as coming out of suspended animation. He's got mechanic, mechanical prosthesis in theory, at least anyway, there's supplement, supplemental protein capsules and all this kind of stuff in the future, but yet they're still using shift gears. Right, you know, right, right. <laughs> automatic gears haven't been invented, but suspended no. animation has. So, <laughs> and, and speaking of sus- suspended animation, I've been something I've been wanting to say is that we've had a few of these movies now where they mentioned suspended animation quite a few times. And yeah. It seemed like something that, like back in the seventies, that was like something that, like um, you know, everybody thought was like right around the corner. And yeah. Of course, you know, like like the flying cars, it really wasn't. But then now it seems like new interest kind of has revived. You know, like kind of with the. Uh, the tech billionaires wanting to kind of, you know, <laughs> all yeah. buy into that. I, I have to, I have to say, I think what's actually happening right now, and you're seeing this actually in the stock market, which I think is quite funny, is that various um, SPACs and these very speculative kind of semi quasi companies that have, you know, get, got loads and loads of funding. It's turning out that yeah, it's a little more difficult to do some of these like groundbreaking, <laughs> disruptive. Ones like there's a, a, a company called Pure Cycle that, uh, um, that was supposedly going to invent some new form of recyclable plastic that could be easily mm. reused. But, it, you know, after a bit, you know, as a research company found out that the directors had done like a, you know, they, they bankrupted a few other companies. And then, of course, the price just tanked because everyone realized oh, this is probably fake. But, you know, <laughs> there's, um, I'm sure we're going to see a hell of a lot more of that over the the next six months to a year. Mm. A lot of these promises, you know, I mean, Elon Musk loves to say <laughs> we'll be, we'll be flying to the moon on a monthly basis and uh, we'll be digging tunnels under California. We will see. I mean, it, it's a, it's a fun story, but uh, something tells me that reality will, will, will intervene at some point and it will not be quite so glamorous. But as we well, talked about in brave new world, the extremes will get sort of marginalized mm. into something that's a more of a common truth. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think the funny thing goes back to is this idea that, you know, like, um, I mean, a lot of these things are possible, but it's just, you know, how willing are we to pay the price? You know I mean? That, that's what exactly, it comes down yeah. to. Yeah. And, or yeah, because there's plenty of really amazing inventions like hollow lens and stuff, but they cost in fortune. So it's, you can do it if you pay enough. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of which, his Frankenstein's kind of um, his attitude to life is kind of interesting in that, huh. you know, he says that winning is the only standard of excellence, which I thought was an interesting mm. um, idea that, uh, you know, he's representative of this society where the only way is, is you know, br- brutal kind of competitiveness is the only way to sort of get ahead in life. Um and yeah. then ultimately, like, you know, he, you know, by overturning things, you know, like, it, I think it's even more interesting that he becomes the leader, right? So, yeah. you know, so, so he did win, you know, like, kind of big in the end and stuff. Yeah, Not absolutely. Really a race and, you know, like, uh, I mean, you know, the whole ultimate power kind of thing and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I also think it was really interesting that, and they didn't spell it out for you, you know, that this idea that he's you know been injured all these times and Mm. but then you come to realize basically he's just a kind of a puppet of the uh government Mm. essentially and he's probably been replaced several times and it's it's really this idea of you know having a a a hero an immortal hero that the common Mm. man can rally around to uh you know let let the the powers that be get away with what they want to do right that doesn't sound like the Vatican or anything, does it now? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that was an interesting, um, that was a really interesting, and well, the fact that they, they, they didn't spell it out too exactly was good, I right. think. Right. And that's, you know, like kind of, um, you know, any country, right, that has like s- some, you know, kind of martyrs and stuff like that. I mean, that's really what it comes down to two different times. It's somebody who, like you said, is immortal, kind of or immortalized by the people, 
um, because of you know for what reason they they found them popular and stuff like that. And just, like you said, it's like kind of creating the story that like um, you know that the revolution you know lives on through you know our leaders all like that. And, yeah. And it's almost, I mean, it's almost identical to Rollerball story as well, really. Mm, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's less, I think what's interesting in this, the differences, I suppose, would be that this is more political and that it's political totalitarianism, whereas in Rollerball, it's corporate kind of right. overreach. So at least, um, at least with the original, we'll get into the remake kind of you know, yeah, yeah, commentary yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think um, aside from, that the I mean the, the, there is also this sort of interesting idea that the media um, basically makes scapegoats out, um, out of foreign powers for its own problems. And that you notice it's the French oh, being right. blamed for all of this, which that was really funny. <laughs> the <French. laughs> like, oh, there's damn French again, you know. Um, I'm surprised that, that was, they don't blame out the Canadians. That would have been even funnier. I know. Yeah. So that was that was kind of funny. The French are bombing cars in the middle of the states. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a fun watch though. I thought, and you know, obviously there's the other, you know there's the quite a bit of gratuitous nudity, quite a bit. That of, was surprising. You know, heads being run over. So you know, by right. the, but it's kind of it's one of those things, kind of like a bit like. Um, the whole sort of grindhouse thing is that yeah. if your theme if your themes are satirical enough and it's obviously in a frame of comedy then you can't really take the gratuitous sex and violence too seriously <laughs> i mean there's a great scene of sylvester stallone with with i think it was like clam sauce all over his face <laughs> at one point it's just like it's just like really you know messily eating clams which was quite fun but yeah um and i i mean i got kind of a bit lost as to the rebellion and who was actually in control of that and who mm. was doing which rebellious act and at what point did frankenstein know that his co-driver was part of the rebellion oh, right. what, what was the real motivation to keep her yeah. around it was uh and, and it's, it's kind of funny how like that was all kind of this kind of um uh side plot i guess um you know along with the race and everything. And then meanwhile, like you said, yeah, it was like kind of, you know, uh, w when was like kind of Frankenstein part of that or not? And like, kind of, or, and then, um, you know, his navigator, you know, kind of uh, the, the Annie character, like, you know, I guess she was the daughter of the, um, yeah. the matriarch and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did sign the whole idea. It was quite funny of a hand grenade that was literally a grenade in a hand and <laughs> you know that was his plan that by right. then, the moment of shaking hands he's going to blow himself up but uh right yeah there were, there were quite a few wildly e. coyote type of traps in the whole thing i mean the yeah. uh the, the landmines that they like planted in the middle of the desert and the car would just drive over to that particular spot you know like a, uh, I, I think that this part is truly like the, the one of the funniest part was like you know they, they teased you like kind of you know that the car kind of was you know, avoiding it, avoiding yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So close. Yeah, the other bit I didn't really get at all, and I mm -hmm. don't know, if the, the whole chicken in a basket scene huh. where there's the th three random dudes just standing in the road. Right. And, and they're standing there waiting for the car, and then all of a sudden two of them jump down a manhole. But then right. they close, so, so, oh, I see. So they're playing it right now. I get it, I get it. So it's somehow a game of like last man in the manhole, mm. but surely everyone would just go for the manhole as soon as you saw the car, so you get killed. It's a very odd scene, but I mean, it's a good <laughs> excuse to have someone's head being crushed by a car. Right. So. Um, yeah, so there's lots of strangeness and uh, interesting Again, things like that. I think it just, you know, like definitely, uh, you know, Roger Corbin's humor, <laughs> I think that's really what we were seeing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, any more thoughts on the original? Um, probably one, you know, only other thing that I, you know, would mention is like, uh, 
you know, you kind of mentioned the, you know about kind of the Vatican's look at. It. It's interesting how they kind of had um, a glimpse of like televangelists, you know, like with this religious leader. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and and it's something that like um, hadn't really caught on yet in around the seventies and stuff like that. So mm. it's interesting that that was kind of even you know another almost like prediction, right, of you know what was to come. Yeah, it, it's yeah. That was interesting, wasn't it? It's kind of like religiously ordained violence as part of society mm. was, uh, yeah, very kind of Roman era. Because you always think of like the the Roman emperor was kind of like the incarnate god who was sort mm. of saying, "Now please go and kill yourselves," um, sort of thing. So. Well, yeah, religion like kind of um, mixed with like kind of a entertainment kind of aspect and stuff. Yeah, sort of hypocrisy of the morality of it, I suppose, mm. is kind of, yeah, the point. Yeah, so now we'll come on to something that I, one of my <laughs> latest sort of pet uh, interests with these remakes is to look at, do a bit of data diving. So I started sort of thinking, what was, what prompted a Death Race remake in 2008, 2008 because they had been trying to make it since 2002 mm. and nobody was really that interested in it. Right. Um, and it only really started to get seriously talked about and produced in 2005. And I thought, what is it about, you know, the late 2000s that would get, you know, a story like Death Race remade? And then you look at the themes in it and basically it is this, it's a theme of injustice in that you have this blue collar worker who's being kind of wrongly accused, wrongly imprisoned. And actually 2008 was pretty much the peak incarceration rate in the US mm. at that point in time. Pretty much um, the figures have been tracking up slowly from, from the nine, you know, from the early nineties and um there was a sort of a dip around the late 90s, but it pretty much kept on going all the way through the 2000s. And I actually went through the process of counting up all the movies that have been made about prisons from 1930 through to like recent oh. times. And for instance, you know, between the 50s, the 60s, there was like under 10 movies about prisons made in those okay. decades. In the 70s, there were 17. So it obviously started ticking wow. up. In the 80s, only 24, so not a huge increase. Then the 90s, especially the early 90s, and mm. I'm guessing things like the LA riots, probably gang violence, all this kind of stuff, um, that ticked up to that 35 movies during the 90s about prisons. I guess we had mm. like the Shawshank Redemption, various other things yeah. that were more sort of high profile ones. Right. Now the 2000s, you oh. had 55 movies wow. made about prisons in the 2000s. And four seasons of Prison Break, one of the you know mm -hmm. most yes. popular TV shows at the time, with, with the same idea of a Wong Fu, you know, imprisonment. Exactly. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So I, I think that, you know incarceration was a big deal during the two yeah. thousands, and obviously a fear that everyone um, was thinking about, and it extended across all sorts of um, different genres as well, because you had like comedies about being in prison, you had right. musicals, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And, right. you know, there was a, just a whole slew of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was an interesting one. So definitely, you know, people at studios look at these kind of things and say, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, we saw that uh, in 2007, there was seven prison movies and they all did pretty well. So let's green light mm -hmm. death race, you know. So no surprise, this one is set predominantly in a prison for the first half an hour of the movie. Yeah, and, and embedded is a key uh, part of the story is this idea that, you know, corporations are running the prisons and then, you know, like the motivation different times is, you know, the more you fill them up, the more profit and stuff. Yeah, and, and I think it was, I mean, credit to uh, writers and Paul Anderson, you know, uh, tacking onto this idea of the injustice of corporations running a, a, a penal system and rigging it so that people mm. stay there longer was pretty pretty interesting i think the other the other theme again is really reality tv you know this was definitely the 2000s were definitely the decade yeah. when reality yes. tv came to the fore <sighs> yeah i mean it started with big brother and all this kind of stuff in the early 2000s and before you know it we've got people cooking and dancing and everything else so <laughs> right. and and it's just again it's, it's it's similar to death the original death race really just an extension of taking that to its most gory outcome really and 
you know, unlike on most remakes where the, um, you know, original creators have very little to do uh, with, you know, like kind of the production stuff. Apparently, you know, Roger Corman was, you know, somewhat involved with this one and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that that he was he was you know part of it. Um, far less political this one in the and and nowhere near a satire. Like none of the char- no. the characters are just more like demographics in rather than actual satire of different types of violent movie. Um, like likewise, you know, there's no kind of no talk about the president of the world in his summer house or anything you know too loopy like that. So there's a, I mean I think. There's a lot of action in it. I mean, I would say the last sort of 40 minutes is almost like one long action sequence, yeah. more or less. But um, yeah, none of the kind of satire and comedy and certainly none of the, the sort of gratuitous sex and violence of the original, mm-hmm. which makes it a far right. less worthy movie in my book. But <laughs> I mean, I think by now we're really into the kind of the Dark Knight era, like kind of, you yeah, know, like, yeah, like yeah. you know, where, um, you know, here, uh, you know, Jason Stratham is even playing an anti-hero and stuff. Um, and, you know, like, granted, you know, like, the original had an anti-hero, but it, I think, like, it, just the, the way, like, kind of, like you said, it's, it's less satirical, it's less, you know, kind of um, a cartoonish kind of um, vision. It's a much darker view of the future, um, you know, like, kind of, I mean, you know, the, the, certainly the action of violence in this one is, you know, like, pretty much like, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, whether you call it state of the art, whatever, it's, like, really mm. about, like, kind of, you know, this kind of grittiness, this realism. Yeah, it's lots of pyrotechnics and, you know, things explode up more detail and money being spent on it. Whereas in the original, the future was portrayed as a racetrack <laughs> with some matte painting of a futuristic city right. in the background was about as far as you got. This one, you know, I mean, not that it's particularly, I mean, it's set in 2012 because everybody thought, you know, the Mayan calendar was going to cause right. the end of the world in 2012 back in 2008. But, um, yeah, it's uh, aside from that, it doesn't really you know foretell anything too major in terms of futurism i mean the one thing that annoyed me was that really the Mm. the first kind of 25 minutes was pretty tiresome in that like most movies of the late 90s and early 2000s Mm. you can't have a protagonist where you're wondering what their backstory is they have to kind of do it all through exposition and showing them at their home and their loving family and then this and oh yeah you remember oh, you were supporting the unions and then the police came along and, oh, what an, you know, it's just like, oh, God, just get to the race already, you know. <laughs> let's, let's see some, let's see Joe Viterbo gunning some people down in the <laughs> audience. And so, yeah, I mean, it does all that. But once it gets past that, you know, it becomes mm. a fairly sort of sort of standard thing. And you've got Ian right. McShane as, as this weird kind of, you know, coach, coach figure. It's like, <laughs> why? It's, it's, and it's one of these sort of things that I think it's almost like Karate Kid or something started this whole thing that you need some sort of older mentor around to teach people how to kill people in a car or you know it's like he's such he's a pretty redundant character really um i, I think sure. also, also like you know he he kind of moves the exposition along right between him and the, yeah, the, exactly. the character called lists you like know, you know like rattling off like oh this and that character and that this and that character giving you like you know kind of the like like the only other thing you i can imagine them doing was like propping up like you know like kind of like a slide right it's like um just like the the way they have the, the driver's profiles before the races and stuff yeah 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 but it's, that's you're right often it's i mean even in yeah newer movies there are some characters that literally are just there to move the exposition along and do very little else so yeah that's kind of his main role in this um i mean but i guess he's just He's probably been making Deadwood at this point, Ian McShane. Yeah. So his sort of gritty American accent is on <laughs> sort of full force in this one. Um, but he's just, he's a weird character in that, like, he's just there hanging around. He's, he's been given parole and he can leave, but he just hangs around because he's got some weird psychological issue that means he likes just staying in prison the whole time. Right. And, um, or just there to move exposition along when it's convenient. Or blow up the warden, you know. Oh, speaking of which, uh, yeah, Joan, Joan Allen, uh, yeah, plays the warden, and uh, I, I thought, you know, like kind of, she she does a impressive job of like kind of, you know, like just something about her that different times she has this presence that different times, you know, speaks authority and like you know, don't don't mess with her or something like that. <laughs> yeah, she's a good she's a good sort of uh, baddie. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what else she's been in. She's very familiar, and I'm sure she's been in a ton of Man stuff. Hunter, but... actually. Right, yes. That's I forgot right, about actually. her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, she was excellent. Yeah, of course, she was amazing in that. So, yeah. And then uh, as his her sidekick, you know, uh, funny enough, um, we have, yeah. uh, you know, Jason. Uh, <laughs> um, Again, very much Clark. probably do, doing very well these days. He's been in loads of stuff, hasn't he? From what Did, yeah, he didn't have many lines in that one, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it, he, he's a far, he has a far more, uh, or far fewer lines than you than will, of course, from Pet Cemetery and uh, the Terminator Pet Cemetery. Series, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that just sort of struck me whilst I was watching, whilst we were going through all the exposition and the backstory stuff. Mm. Um, oh, I've just lost your video. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It's, it's me accidentally clicking. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I thought it was something else that happened too. So. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. So we're going through all this exposition, you know, and is, you know, he's a poor steel mill worker standing up for his fellow workers, struggling to make a living. And he, and you know, he's just about to kiss his beautiful wife, but then, oh, the newborn is over the baby monitor because he's also got a newborn. He's just like, what a, what a stand up guy. And, you know, after he's been standing up for his fellow workers, he comes in and he says, Hey, there was trouble down at the mill. And his wife says, you know, you're a good man. And I just thought, has my wife ever said that to me? You know, I've walked in through the door and she said, you know what, Dan? a good man it's, like, it's one of these things that only happens in movies and the but, kind of thing that like you know if, if she said that you kind of like look at her like you know she's going next yeah. to her head and just be like what have, what have you bought or you know what have, yeah, what, what have you done with my wife are you gonna are you gonna suddenly start like kind of growing tentacles and <laughs> i know right yeah yeah it's so um, oh. Um, also, one of my, 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 my favorite shot uh, in this movie, which I actually oh, thought was okay. kind of inadvertently really funny, is the bit where his wife gets killed and then it cuts to a shot and she's cooking onions and then he gets knocked unconscious and then it cuts to a shot of the onions being burnt. Spurts. And I was like, not only has your wife been killed, but you've burnt the onions too. <laughs> that was a really, really, really weird choice of editing. But yeah. Um, oh, oh, one other character I wanted to mention too, like kind of uh, for 14K, the uh, the Chinese driver and stuff like that. It was actually Robin Shu, who was okay. from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, I didn't I didn't recognize him. Yeah, yeah, I didn't either. Okay, okay. So, so another funny connection to. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? And, and apparently, and apparently, he goes on to somehow be revived the uh, the the sequels too. So, go figure. <laughs> okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, maybe he's the uh, Frankenstein of those movies or something. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I was paying attention for about the first hour. Mm -hmm. And then when it started getting into the relentless sort of action sequences, I started getting a little too drawn into my statistics of prison movies. And <laughs> um, then I started sort of, because I was just like, it was just constantly sort of racing and people blowing up and stuff. So, yeah. But I, I mean, was it, it wasn't, a, I mean, certainly not as good as the original by any stretch. Um, was it a good movie? Meh, it's kind of vaguely watchable, watchable I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of probably good if you're drunk, I would say. I'd recommend <laughs> it if you're drunk. It's, it's it's one of those movies that like like you you know you kind of almost uh, pointed out is that you can kind of like look up stats and kind of put it on the background. And, yeah, you don't have to pay too much. Come back to watching it like every every now and then. Between you're, not, stats. you're not gonna you're not gonna mess anything really. You know we all know it's gonna happen. Um, yeah, you know they there's a lot of sort of stuff like the guy has to release the tombstone and it kind of blows up the car and then the tombstone's not gonna take it and all that gets used again and i don't know you know stuff like this there's a jet and it's a bit like a bond movie in a way because a lot of these mm. cars have got like you know they've got oil slicks they've yeah. got ejector seats you know they've got machine guns so it's it is kind of a game aspect too i almost figured yeah. that they would at some point would have made a game you know like kind of because they had like kind of the the, the um these uh potholes or whatever or, or buttons that kind of the cars drive over and it activates the you know things and stuff it, it's very much kind of um i almost feel like they got the ideas from you know video games yeah i mean i i think that the original probably sort of 
gave people lots of ideas for video games. I mean, <laughs> right points, right? <laughs> I mean, I think there is almost certainly some death race game out there. I mean, there's, I think if so. not, there must be at least several thousand games all on a very similar sort of theme. Well, the whole uh, Grand Theft Auto kind of, you know, basically, it's not officially supposed to be like that, but in the end, that's what it really is. You know, it's I mean, kind I've... of like a death race. Off the top of my head, I can think of Spy Hunter, Road Blasters, yes. Twisted Metal, uh, Burnout, I guess, to some degree. You know, there's, there's tons of them out there and from various decades. It's uh, cars shooting, being able to shoot other cars and stuff is right. it's a pretty perennial theme in video gaming. So, yeah, Wipeout, more recently. Oh, right. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I know there are several sequels to it as well. I think there's like a Death Race, a new Death Race 2 and a new Death Race 3, which is surprising because actually I was, it didn't make a massive amount of you money. Know? Yeah, it it made like say. $10 million on a budget of, what was it, 70 or 80 or something like this? So it's it so surprising. Makes you wonder. Yeah. yeah. What, what, um, yeah, why they thought it was, it, it had legs really. Um, I don't know how successful the, my guess is they weren't that successful, but. Um... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, by then, uh, you know, by the time the sequel, you know, came around, so again, only a couple of years, um, you know, Jason Stratham had become, you know, much more popular as an actor, so they couldn't mm. afford him for the, you know, the sequel <laughs> stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. But it was again produced by Paul W.S. Anderson, um, oh, okay. and uh, so and then you know like like we mentioned, Robin Shu, like I guess apparently he hadn't gotten many gigs, so you know he, he was back for somehow being reborn, I guess, and stuff. I guess so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, which which did you prefer of the two? Um, I mean, the original kind of is, is a classic. I mean, you know, you can't yeah. be you know like kind of just. Just the uh, the tongue in cheek kind of humor of uh, the um, you know just just the satire aspects uh, and and there's nothing that you know like kind of euthanasia day at the hospital. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I guess then we should we maybe go back and revisit this whole idea of the Hunger Games because I'm just trying to remember when the first Hunger Games movie was because that is a you know it's such a clear kind of copy yeah. really in 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 terms of um, theme. Well, we could definitely talk about the Hunger Games in the future, you know, as, oh, as sure. a remake of Battle Royale and stuff. Yeah, I mean, well, the thing is, some some people argue that uh, it isn't. I mean, it is and it isn't really. It's not kind of an unofficial remake, but I, I think it's more like a modern remake of Death Race 2000, to be honest. Huh. But this is very much a 2010s movie, isn't it? Because it's 2012, the first one. Mm. So it's, I mean, I think by the time we got to the 2010s, people were really embracing conspiracy theories on mass and felt like, you know, mm. everything was going to get horribly inequality. And we were going to be made sort of wage slaves and things like, well, but we, you know, literal slaves. So maybe that's really where the, the strength or the, or the appeal from hunger games comes from, I guess. And, and also um, beyond like kind of, you know, just, you know, you were talking about the trend and prison movies and stuff. I think this was the rise of the teen apocalyptic, um, you know, films there was like kind of this wave mm. and you know kind of it's kind of died off but i think you know you had that you had the divergent series um yeah. you know just just like all of these kind of came around that time and and i feel like that's an echo of how um you know after the you know the real estate crash and stuff like that people were pretty much pessimistic for you know like the future that, that, in general what, the think. future in general and what what the future we're leaving right for the next generation you know specifically Absolutely. you know kind of yeah, yeah. younger I think you're absolutely right. I think I think that's really what sparked this whole theme of even Twilight. I think in some respects you can sort of say is is somewhat on similar. But yeah, definitely like the you know Divergent and Hunger Games definitely tap into that because it's it's a it's a theme. I mean, definitely it's funny like the number of movies about prisons once you get past 2010 drops off dramatically. I mean, mm. it's it's really interesting that there's very few after that. Um, so it obviously wasn't a, a fear. I think our, our fears became much more kind of existential and, you know, probably more about the environment and things like this, like as we saw with or societal sort of problems. So, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then that's when uh, the zombie movies started really kicking in, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I guess we will, we'll have to sort of dig into that when we find a 2010 uh, remake and look at, dig into that data a little more about the 2010s <laughs> perhaps but 
any, any other yeah. last thoughts about like kind of um you know the the, the the remake of 2000 or or actually um just the death race um series in general and stuff no i mean i guess for me it's, it's been a long time since i've watched the original and yeah, looking looking here. at it now through some sort of fresh eyes i realized just how clever it was really <laughs> um so yeah it was it was you know nice nice to watch again but nothing i, I think all my insights have been exhausted at this point so <laughs> yeah i think um you know looking forward to kind of talking more um you know like looking at the fast and furious as another uh, you know, Roger Corman kind of, you know, property. And, and I think that's an interesting aspect as well, is that like, you know, here we are mining kind of, you know, like um, we've talked quite a bit about Stephen King and how like, you know, his stuff is like kind of, you know, made, remade and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, it's funny how Roger Corman has been kind of like this uh, nucleus for, you know, not only like kind of things that have been remade, but also like different um, actors and also different, um, you know, like folks like, you um, uh, James Cameron, you know, the Titanic, mm. you know, were, were these, um, you know, filmmakers and, you know, like uh, Martin Scorsese is another one that got their, you know, first breaks from, you know, this, uh, you know, prolific uh, filmmaker and stuff. Mm, yeah. No, I didn't even realize that Fast and Furious was a remake, to be honest with you. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to be interested to do that next week. Cool. So, yeah, um, once again, I'm John Chang with uh, Dan Edmonds, and uh, we'll see you next time.